Well, good evening to everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's production of a play about the Brisbane family and the Brisbane mansion. As Richard mentioned, I'm Larry Barnes, the appointed city historian. The script for tonight's play was written by Derek Maxfield of GCC, and it's based uh, largely on information that's in a book that I wrote a few years ago about the Brisbane family. We're dedicating this performance tonight to the memory of Catherine Roth. Catherine Roth died very recently at the age of 101. And she was a founder of the Landmark Society of Genesee County. Yeah. So I'm going to set the stage for tonight's production by providing you with some background information. Can you hear me all right? I can't tell if you can Oh, yeah. OK, good. Well, first of all, what is the Brisbane Mansion? The Brisbane Mansion is the building at 10 West Main Street, a brick structure with a cupola on top that's currently occupied by the Batavia Police Department. It was the city hall for Batavia from 1918 to 2004. And prior to that, it was the home of George and Sarah Brisbane, who lived in it from about 1853 until their deaths near the turn of the century. Second of all, who are the Brisbane's? And to answer that question, we need a, a brief uh, history of our own area. Following the American Revolution, Western New York was still a wilderness, occupied primarily by the Seneca Indians at the time. As a result of English grants to the colonies of Massachusetts and New York, this area was granted to both of them. Well, that got resolved in the Treaty of 1786, and in the treaty, Massachusetts took title to the land, and New York remained uh, the governor, governing body for this area. Massachusetts then proceeded to sell the land to developers as quickly as it could. Now, over a period, for a roughly short period of time, through a complex set of uh, sales, the area of uh, Western New York is from Stafford west to Lake Erie, and from Lake Ontario south to the Pennsylvania line, uh, came into the hands of the uh, Dutch investors who were interested in its development. They were known of as the Holland Line Company. The company's land office is the building on West Main Street here in the city that we know of as the Holland Land Office Museum. The company's plan was to survey all 3.5 million acres of land and then to sell the plots off to uh, settlers that would be coming in from the east. For that purpose, it hired uh, Joseph Ellicott. And uh, since that time, Ellicott has given his name to such places as Ellicott Street, Ellicott Avenue, Ellicottville, and many other locations in Western New York. Ellicott needed somebody to be in charge of the supplies for the survey team that was to survey this area. And <coughs> he hired a young man from Philadelphia, a 22-year-old man, uh, for that job. Enter James Brisbane. Once the survey was completed in 1800, Ellicott went on to handle the land sales to lay out streets also and to lay out roads and other such matters. James Brisbane, recognizing the golden opportunity when he saw it, decided to become an early settler, a pioneer of our community. He became the first merchant. Shortly after that, he became the first postmaster. And he lived in one of Batavia's very first homes, just west of where our current post office is located. He soon married uh, Mary Stevens, the sister of one of the other early settlers, and proceeded to invest in prime real estate. He had a very good eye for good real estate, and he became very wealthy in short order. 
In a time when families tended to have scads of kids, Brisbane's, however, had only two. They had a son, Albert, born in 1809, and a George, born in 1812. In tonight's play, set in the late 1870s, you will meet George, who built the Brisbane mansion after uh, his father's death, using money he had inherited from his father. As you listen to the dialogue between George and his wife, Sarah, whom he had married in 1848, you will hear in the initial dialogue between the husband and wife a discussion of the recent murder demonstrating to us that, unfortunately, uh, violent crimes are nothing new. Later, you will observe a brief visit from General Henry Upton. Upton was a local man who gained fame for his leadership during the Civil War. Upon Upton's appearance, we are reminded that our area has given birth to many individuals who have gained national standing. But the highlight of tonight's play is a visit from Albert Brisbane, George's older brother. As will be evident from the exchanges between the two men, they have a very uh, difficult relationship. It's fraught with tension. Two individuals could not be any different than Albert and George. Their father had left his great wealth to the two of them on his father's death, on their father's death, uh, with instructions that they were to work out between them how to handle the inheritance. That, unfortunately, led to all kinds of trouble that effectively ruined the brothers' relationship. In the course of the, of the dialogue tonight, you will have a quick grasp of their differing perspectives on life. As play draws to a close, we will hear Sarah express concern about the future of the mansion, a matter that concerns us today. She realizes that their only child, James, named after his grandfather, would not want to live in Batavia, nor would he want to retain possession of the mansion. So she says, what's going to become of our grand old home? She knows that George thinks that maybe the village of Batavia would be interested in purchasing it. And we know that that's eventually what happened. That has turned out to be just a temporary situation. And now we're faced again with a question of what's going to become of this grand old mansion. Tonight's performance may leave you with uh, questions that you have or thoughts you'd like to share, and there will be a question and answer session following the performance, which I hope you will be able to stay and take part in. Our play now begins with George returning from his daily visit to a barber. As he was wont to do, George tosses coins to children who follow him at a distance. Children kept their distance because it was rumored that George was a crazy man. <laughs> and maybe sometimes he was. So, okay, George, come on home. just yet, but he had been to Batavia and had returned home. It was after dark by that time, and he was walking toward his barn, and he was assailed from behind with a pitchfork. And then once he was on the ground, he was hit on the front of the head with a pitchfork as well. Once the poor man was unconscious, he was robbed, and his attacker fled. Oh, how awful. And how is Mr. Hill? Poor Mrs. Hill, she's such a dear woman. She must have seemed to be mortified. Well, he's alive. His skull is frightfully damaged, though. I don't know if he'll survive. Dr. Croft is attending him. Thank you. Was the attacker apprehended? Did Mr. Hill know of the man who assaulted him? Well, to my knowledge, 
the man hasn't been identified or apprehended. There are search parties out. This is so disturbing, George. Might there be a way we could aid the Hills? Perhaps we could contribute to a recovery fund. Yes, that sounds fine. Let's do that. How is your coffee, George? Uh huh? Uh, it's fine. Why? Well, there are spots all over the water. Oh. I was wondering if the water tasted all right. That damnable water works. I am sue the village. I'm tired of emissions from that building following our water here. We have complained many times, but they don't know how to fix the problem. They don't wish to spend money to fix the problem. If they just use hard coal or built proper boilers under those furnaces, the problems would cease. I guess I'm going to have to consult our attorney. Oh, by the way, we received a wire from Albert. He is arriving in town this morning and intends to visit. Mm. Does he now? One wonders what the squinty old reprobate wants now. Oh, George, be kind to your brother. Why must you squabble? You know, as well as I do, that the man is a bigamist and a scoundrel. He marries and he remarries, and yet his wife, Ladoisa, still lives. Lord knows how many little Brisbane's were sired in Europe as he went romping from one harlot to another. <laughs> yes, poor Ladoisa has been left out in the cold. But you do not know that Albert fathered children out of marriage. You are speculating. Speculating? That is not fair to your brother. Speculating? The character of the man, madam, is known. That one I pimp has slept with more women and assaulted with a hair of a George. And now, he has gone and married a child 40 years his junior. Does Redelia know that the man is married? Redelia is not a child, George. She's at least in her 30s. And the man does not tend to his responsibilities. He leaves me to tend to all of his business affairs. He just can't be bothered. Meanwhile, he trots about Europe, betting women, starting communes with his head in the clouds. Why did your father organize his estate this way? To share and share alike? That seems to be at the root of your conflict with Albert. I don't know why it must be so. Albert renounced his executorship years ago. Gave me power of attorney over the whole estate. He just couldn't be bothered. All he wanted was enough, move, enough money to fund his escapades. Uh, perhaps he finds himself in need of money. No, do not let money govern your relationship with your brother. Be generous, give him whatever he wants. We have all we need. There's no need to argue over trifles. You know, I wish I had known your mother. She, from what I know of her, she was a very intelligent and kind-hearted woman. And your father was a very spirited conviviality. I do miss him so. Yes, mother was certainly a fond of wisdom and love, was she not? Father was sharp as a tap. Very wonder of nature. Oh, he was a wonder. You should write a book about your father. Was her a happy father in Batavia? Well, I guess you could say so. Your father came here in the 1790s surveying land for Howell's purchase. I like it himself named my father the uh, purveyor of supplies. Yeah. Later, he opened the first general store in town. Wasn't your father originally from Philadelphia? That's true. That's where my grandparents had settled. My father didn't move here until permanently until after the turn of the century. Yes, I think Jefferson was then president. Yeah, soon after moving here, we was made Batavia's first postmaster. Well, your father James certainly has a head for business. Didn't he make his money in land and railroads? Yes, that's true. But you know, it wasn't just about buying land. He knew how to buy the right land. Must have owned uh, over 250 acres just in the Batavia area alone. Of course.
course, he had that valuable property in Buffalo uh, as well. But it was his investment in the Tunnel Under Railroad. That was inspired. That was the first rail line to service Batavia, you know. That's what made a rich man. Well, being rich is fine, but it's the content of the man's character that counts, George. Your parents should be remembered for their generosity and many contributions to society. They did so much for this community. But they're not founders of St. James Church. Well, I don't know that I would say founders exactly. It's not like they ever attended a service there. <clears throat> Hmm. They did, if I recall, give hundreds for its construction, though. Hmm. Hmm. You know, this brings to mind a story about my mother during the War of 1812. I'm not sure if I ever told you this, Sarah. The British had just burned Buffalo, and the army fell back on Batavia in desperate need of supplies. My mother mounted a fast horse and went galloping about the countryside, gathering provisions. Sometimes rather forcefully, too. Oh, yeah. She took to the wind, brought in what the army needed in its most desperate hour. Oh, she was such an incredible woman. You know, I think that... Excuse me, Mr. Bristol. Yes? A General Emery Upton is calling? General Upton? Shall I show him in? Well, certainly. Well, General Upton, it's a pleasure to see you, sir. Mr. Brisbane, it is my pleasure. You know my wife, Sarah. I do not believe I've had a pleasure. Good day, Mrs. Brisbane. Good day. Please, General, have a seat. Tell me, what brings you to town? A flying visit to the family farm and some business. I can only uh, tarry for a few days before I report to Fortress Monroe in Virginia. Oh, I see. Tell me, how is my friend Daniel? My father is well. He's advanced in age and requires assistance. And Mrs. Upton, I trust she is well. My mother is well. She is a great help to my father. Yes, sir. You know, now that I see you, sir, it reminds me that I never had the opportunity in person to express my regret for the loss of your wife, Mrs. Upton. This is most regrettable. Yes. We were most unsettled by Mrs. Upton's passing, General. I hope you'll accept her sincere condolences. I'm very sorry I never had the chance to meet her. Thank you. That is very kind. Of course I miss her, dear. I certainly do. General, can I get you some refreshment? Coffee? Tea? No, no, thank you. No, thank you, no. Um, I cannot stay long. Of course. You mentioned Fortress Monroe. Um, what's your duty there? I am the uh, instructor at the artillery school there. Oh, how interesting. Is this agreeable to me? It is. It uh, affords me time to work on my latest project, a book examining the military policy of the United States. Oh, how interesting. I know little of such matters. But you know, it occurs to me that I read just recently that you published a volume on foreign armies. Uh, true, true. My, my book on the armies of Asia and Europe was recently published. Congratulations, General. Thank you, Mrs. Brisbane. Hmm. You know, I, I was wondering, did you ever meet General Winfield Scott, sir? I, I met the general on a few occasions, but I never really had a chance to get to know the man. Oh, what a pity. Such a fascinating man. Did you know, sir, that General Scott was a guest of my parents here during the War of 1812? I really, um, I know he saw my service on the Niagara frontier and fought along the river there. Yes, that's true. Well, he had been grievously wounded during the Battle of Lundy Lane when the army fell back here. And while he was recuperating, he stayed with my parents in their home, which was previously on this very property. Mm -hmm. My father and he became fast friends. Oh, interesting. I did not know this before now. So you remember the general? Oh, heavens, no. I was, I was far too young. And sadly, I, I don't recall ever meeting the man again. Still, though, it, is, it is good that your family can boast of having hosted such an illustrious guest. Yes, I would agree. Say, tell me, have you seen General Sherman recently? Yes, we, we dined recently. Sherman as well. 
He uh, still travels extensively and is in excellent health and spirits. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. I can't recall my last sign. But you know, I just finished reading his memoirs, which I found most detailed and very compelling. So oh, I, I agree, Mr. Brisbane. And of course, they have occasioned uh, some controversy. Is that so? Well, that, that's to be expected. Everybody is anxious to look out for their own, uh, their own fortunes. You know, military men, especially generals, tend to have large numbers. Yes, I would imagine that that would be true. Tell me, do you think, will President Grant ever write his memoirs? I would be most interested in reading his account of the war. No, I do not think he will. I, I have heard it said that he intends Battle's book to be the last word. Well, so excuse me, this has been most enjoyable, but I really must be on my way. Oh, well, General, we're most honored by your and visit. You, I was in the neighborhood, and I wanted to pay my respects to your family. I see. Please um, give my regards to your brother, Albert. I cannot recall the last time we met, but I can never forget him. He is a fascinating man. <laughs> That's one word. <laughs> well, I'm told I'll see him later this day, in fact, and I will pass along your regards. Good day, General. Good day, Mrs. Brisbane. Roberts. It's good to see the General. I was so honored that he stopped by. Mm -hmm. I wish he had more time. It looks well, though. Yes, I thought so as well. Well, I have a few matters that I would like to review. Uh, you'll excuse me before Albert comes sweeping in.
How is Mrs. Brisbane this morning? Hi, I'm well, Mr. Brisbane. It's good to see you, sir. Oh. Miss Alberts, or Bertie, you know. We're family. <laughs> we can skip the formalities. Well, now. above 20 years now you've occupied this fine home. Ah, I've always loved the way the light from the cupola shines from the octagonal openings in the ceiling to illuminate the room. I do so love that feature myself. It has been almost 25 years since the house was completed. Ah, yes, yes, of course, of course. Well, I must say, Sarah, I do admire the house. They say buildings have spirits of their own, you know. Yes, I'm glad it does not exude the stuffy, stagnant, and stale character of its master. No. No. It feels. It feels like. Like mother is here. Of course. Why, her generous spirit inhabits and animates this abode. Do you not feel it, madam? You know she's very nearby. Father buried her behind the old house. He wanted to keep her close. <laughs> yes, I do believe George has mentioned something of the sort. You do know that I never got to meet Mrs. Brisbane, sadly. You know, it may be my spirit that wants character to me. My home. <laughs> uh, yes, it's, uh, maybe that. But, how is your son James? James is well. As you know, he lives in Manhattan. Yes, our uh, paths crossed from the city just last year. He seemed busy and content. He is made for city life. Yes, he has very little interest in his hometown. <laughs> can hardly blame the lad. <laughs> There's very little here to stimulate the mind. On that score, where is the uh, old goat? Mr. Brisbane is home, but he is occupied with business at the moment. I'm sure he'll be down at his early to be Ah, uh, yes, I have completed my business. Good day, sir. You look, uh, well. <laughs> have a seat. Tell me, what, uh, what brings you to our backwater, Albert? Is there something amiss, sir? Can I get you something? No. No, no. I will help myself. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> I had some uh, business to attend to in Buffalo, but I'll be returning to New York presently. Business, I see. More of this uh, voyeurism business, I suppose. <laughs> it's Fourierism, George. Fourierism, and. Uh, Give it up on your utopian dreams, have you? Not entirely, no, but uh, the world has changed. It needs associations now more than ever, but I fear industrial society may make them a bit impractical. I'll be returning to Europe soon. I intend to study the issue. Study the issue? Man, when are you going to get your head out of the clouds? Tend to your responsibilities. Sir, how is Mrs. Brisbane? Uh, which one? <laughs> <laughs> Redelia is fine. So, thank you for asking. She sends her compliments. She uh, regrets she is not able to join me. Mm, I would imagine it would be most inconvenient to attend to your uh, business with one of your wives in tow. 
I do not know what you are insinuating, sir. But I have one wife. One. Albert, I am so sorry. I had not heard that poor Lodoiska had passed away. Lodoiska <laughs> is well, to my knowledge. She was not my wife, sir. She was my housekeeper who boarded children. You, sir, are a cat. The scoundrel! You must you taunt me with this? This is not becoming a gentleman. My poor dear Sarah is most disturbed by your base allegations. You follow her to her grave. Do not raise the dead, sir, to cover your tracks. Mrs. Brisbane, Sarah was complicit in your unholy lifestyle. She knew you were married when she consented to marry you, and now you've gone and married again. This is not the behavior of civilized gentlemen. I'm sure Albert understands his responsibility to Lodoiska. George, it is not your place to pass judgment on your brother's lifestyle. Thank you, sir. Of course. We must trust in Providence to guide us. Only God can decide that the consequences of your plan <laughs> by the way, Albert, General Upton passed by this morning and asked if you had one of his cigars to you when you saw him. Did he? General Upton? Well, I must say, I'm somewhat surprised. Barely acquainted. I know we met before the war, and I believe. We may have dined together in New York with a party of others. Jeff Sherman also attended. Still, it must have been 15 years ago. Well, we seem to remember you. You even suggested that you were fascinating. <laughs> I guess the same can be said of him. A very doubt man. I highly doubt the man knows how to enjoy himself. Little matter, though. The man is a hero. He deserves our gratitude. True. It is a funny thing, though, General Upton. And Grant, Sherman, and in Europe, Bonaparte, Wellington, Garibaldi, all Celebrated warriors. Men who dedicated their lives to warfare. Celebrated for making war. <coughs> Grant, Sherman, and Upton at least fought to end slavery. But in America, but this is good. Long ago, but that did little. And slavery global. <laughs> oh. <coughs> Spectre still haunts the world. And the new slavery, urban wage slavery, well, source abomination than ever. These things ever trouble you, brother? Of course not. The only thing that concerns you are your ledgers. You seem to have very little intellectual curiosity, despite mother's best efforts. Was it mother's best efforts that led you to lead a life full, free of responsibility? A life of frivolity? A life of faithlessness? We live in a world where the producers of wealth benefit little from their labor. Some accumulate great wealth, while many 
stop. And the idle rich drink their brandy and smoke their cigars in comfort, contributing no labor yet, collecting the silver earned from the toil of the masses. Says the rich man that's not worth a day in his life. Are you not bothered by the injustice of it all? We don't live off wealth produced by ourselves. We live off the wealth produced by our father. We don't have to contribute anything that we might provide capital for the endeavor of others, but <laughs> expect to profit from that. We've not seen the dire poverty that I've witnessed in other parts of the world. It's ghastly. No, we should aspire to a more equitable distribution of wealth. Oh, there it is. There it is. <coughs> Communism. Is that your answer, sir? There might be poverty in this world, but there is slothfulness, lazy men, confidence men, and you would reward them. They are not my equal, sir. They need to earn the bread the way that honest men do. George, capitalism is a callous machine. It's created the industrial workplace. Factories devour them, working them to death, while robber barons grow fat in their idleness. I fear, brother, you are far too insulated from the dire realities of the market. You do not see the suffering. You speak to me of realities? Since when have you lived in reality? You are a philosopher who lives the life of the mind where ideals reign. Face it, man is a base animal, and nature most certainly does not create an equitable system, sir. The wolf hunts for he starves, and the rabbit most certainly will be eaten. Nature creates winners and losers, predators and prey. George, nature has endowed man with a higher reason. We are capable of taking better care of each other. We should aspire to do better than a system where a few hold the fruit, while those who planted, nurtured, and harvested it starve. Oh, you are too far gone. Living in your dreamland. You have a big heart, but you're far too idealistic. Well, I have responsibilities to tend to, sir. I pray that you tend to yours. Good day. Good day. Never change between us, Sarah. Must it always be us? I cannot say. No, I hope it may change. We both need to be more tolerant and forgiving of the other's ways. Yes, I, I suppose. Oh, did George leave a draft for me? Yes, sir. <laughs> I have other obligations. Thank you. It's good to see you, Sarah. I, uh, I hope you remain well. Please, give my regards to the uh, old crow, won't you? I will.
appears we are at an impasse. Will not listen to me. I begin to understand you. So stutter. Like a bomber. The deal he thinks I should give up on you. Tunnel on the creek right over there. Those were days when very little of the larger world or its concerns. I'm innocent. Ignorant we were. And I ventured off into the broader world while you. Fine home, no doubt. Kind wife. Narrow view. I wonder, my brother. Oh, Anna. What is going to become of them? The sons of Batavia. Sired by a rich man, educated by an enlightened woman, and raised in a wilderness. And how will they be remembered many generations from now? Or will they be forgotten? On a staid, solid, loyal man of business, the other a restless visionary, drifting through life in a daze, pursuing, investigating, theorizing, womanizing. And what will become of our home, this grand edifice, a testament to frontier prosperity, and a physical embodiment of the Brisbane spirit? Did you know, Anna, that our house was the first in Batavia to be made of pressed bricks? And they hired a mason from Buffalo at great expense, because no one here in, Buffalo, no one here in Batavia knew how to make the bricks. Someday, our son James will inherit the place, of course. But I don't think he wants to live here. George said something, maybe the village one is a municipal building. But I know. What is going to become of our grand old home? Well, Anna, my dear, let's take a walk in the garden, shall we? 